basically, if you think about it, it's both. That indeed, <coughs> parts of it are chores. It's the kind of thing that we used to say, what can't be cured must be endured. But a challenge is something that we look forward to, that we get epinephrine geared up for. And so today, I want to take you on a trip on the good ship Courageous. I want to take you around the seven seas that you can become master of. Concern, communication, commitment, competence, confidence, change, and contentment. The seven seas. And you can become master of the seven seas. OK, sea of concern. Who are we supposed to be concerned about? OK, the people close to us, the group, the institution, the world. It all needs a concern. And if you don't have concern, we might as well just not go on this trip at all. Because we need concern about ourselves and about our fellow man. But we move from the sea of concern to the sea of communication. Oh, wow. This is a rough sea. Talk about the perfect storm. Because even when we speak English, we don't speak the same language with the people in England. If you are mean in the United States, you're an unkind person. If you are mean in the UK, you're a cheapskate. And basically, in some countries, this is a wonderful sign. Everything's doing well. In other countries, it's an obscene gesture. In some countries, you have to finish your meal because you tell your host that it was wonderful and I couldn't stop till I finished it. In other countries, you're supposed to leave a little on the plate so that you can tell your host, you gave me more than enough and I'm totally satisfied. It's no wonder that we have problems with treaties, pacts, and so forth. First of all, the language itself, the tone of voice. How many languages can you think of that the tone is part of the language structure? If you want to go and speak Zulu, you better learn how to do clicks, because part of their language is clicks. So the sea of communication is going to take a lot of work from you to master. And then we move on to the sea of commitment. The sea where, oh well, whatever, I was gonna. All of those are part of the verbiage on the sea of commitment. As you all know, in any group, in any team that you've been on, there are people who make things happen, people who let things happen, people who help things happen, people who won't let anything happen, and people who wonder what happened. <laughs> and on the sea of commitment, it's a little difficult to get all your recruits from the top level of the makers. And so you as a leader have a lot of juggling to do to bring people together on the sea of commitment. Because Samuel Taylor Coleridge was right. Day after day, day after day, no breath, no motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. And you've worked with people who are as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. And then we move on to the sea of competence. I want to bring you back five years, January 15th, five years ago, the miracle on the Hudson. An Airbus took off from LaGuardia, final destination, Tacoma, with stop in Charlotte. However, three minutes after it became airborne, it flew into a flock of geese, and they went into the two engines and totally destroyed them. No power. No power to this huge Airbus. So Captain Chesley Sullenberger, brought the airplane around and landed it on the Hudson. And 155 occupants were saved. But the thing you don't read in the paper is that Sullenberger 
not only was a pilot, but on his own time, he had become a glider pilot. Now, when you want to bring in a uh, engineless vehicle, you need a glider pilot. And when you want to do any of those extra things, you've got to go and do the extra mile. You indeed have to, to be competent, you got to work at it. It doesn't drop into your lap. But the confidence that comes with competence is a byproduct of the competence. Bravado is the bastard son of incompetence. But confidence is the legitimate offspring of confidence. And so we now move on. We move on to the sea of change. Oh, this one is a real killer, with waves 100 feet and then to little ripples. However, any of you who are biologists know that to a biologist, change is not a fact of life. It is life itself. If it is not changing, it is not alive. This is true of our brains of our institutions. And one of the phrases in a crossword puzzle, a mumpsimus. A mumpsimus is someone who, being told of a mistake, continues to make it again and again. And we all know that we have organizations that are mumpsimus organizations, not just people. And then we move into the lagoon of contentment. But we can't stay there. Who shows you their sailboat and says, look at how my sailboat sits at anchor? No. Look at how it takes the wind. And that's what we have to do. To become master of the seven seas, we have to take the wind. And we have to move with it. Rest, yes but then get back out onto the seven seas of concern, communication, commitment, <coughs> excuse me, competence, confidence, change. And then we earn the contentment. I'm going to just quote one poem for you, anonymous. I don't know who the author is. I used to have a comfort zone where I knew I couldn't fail with the same four walls and busy work, it was almost like a jail. I longed so much to do the thing I'd never done before, but I stayed inside my comfort zone and paced the same old floor. I said it didn't matter that I wasn't doing much. I said I didn't care for commission checks and such. I longed to do the things that I've never done before, but I stayed inside that comfort zone. I couldn't let the world go by just watching others win. I stepped outside my comfort zone and let the change begin. I took a breath, and with a strength I'd never known before, I stepped outside my comfort zone and closed and locked the door. So if you're in a comfort zone, afraid to venture out, remember that all winners were at one time filled with doubt. So take a breath, and with words of praise, success will see you through. Step outside your comfort zone. Success belongs to you. Thank you.